Emily Chana Spraker with the City of Savannah's Municipal Archives, and I want to welcome you to another Hungry for History program. This year, we are launching a series of shorter programs called History Bites. I'm pleased to have Jamie Cradle from the Davenport House Museum join us today to share a bite of history regarding Madeira wine and Spana. If you haven't had the pleasure of meeting Jamie Cradle, Jamie is the director of the Davenport House, the only museum property owned by the Historic Savannah Foundation, where she has run operations since 2002. Prior to her arrival in Savannah, she served 10 years at the museums at Stony Brook in New York, the Jekyll Island Museum, the Virginia Museum of Transportation, Shadows on the Tesh with the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Louisiana, the Cape Fear Museum in North Carolina, and the McFadden Ward House in Bowman, Texas. Jamie graduated from Salem College in Winston-Salem, North Carolina with a BA in History and English and the University of North Carolina in Greensboro with an MA in American History and Public History. She recently completed the Addingham Study Program on Historic Houses of Ireland. Jamie writes regularly on antebellum life in Savannah and is working with Davenport House staff and volunteers on interpretation, interpretive materials for a new urban slavery exhibition at the property. In 2005, she accepted the Davenport House's Preservation in America Presidential Award for Private Preser Preservation from George W. Bush. And in 2013, she received the Southeastern Museum Conference's Museum Leadership Award. I'm very happy to welcome Jamie Cradle. Well, my name is Jamie Cradle, and I'm the director of the Davenport House Museum. And I'd like to talk a bit about uh, Madeira wine and its connection with Savannah, Georgia. Um, it has a long and storied past. Um, one of our uh, recent publication, uh, Garden and Gun Magazine had uh, a section on what should be the Southern drink, um, uh, the, the, um, the drink that would be identifiable with Southern uh, alcoholic beverage. And some people had thought about uh, whiskey, um, but there was a contingent that thought that Madeira wine should be a signature Southern drink. Um, so uh, uh, this, my talk will sort of discuss that uh, and you can decide for yourself. Uh, but uh, one of the quotes that I like to begin with is from uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, where the antique dealer Jim Williams talks about Madeira. Uh, it sort of encapsulates the uh, late 20th century idea of Madeira. Uh, Williams says, uh, Williams picked up the decanter of Madeira and refilled uh, our glasses, saying, drinking Madeira is a great Savannah ritual, you know. It's a celebration of failure, actually. The British ship sent whole shiploads of grapevines over from Madeira in the 18th century in hopes of turning Georgia into a wine producing colony. Savannah's on the same latitude as Madeira. Well, the vines died, but Savannah never lost its taste for Madeira or any other liquor for that matter. Prohibition didn't even slow down it that here. Everybody had a way of getting liquor, even the low ladies, especially the low ladies. So just know that Madeira First is an island off the coast of North Africa, and it is a, a, a mountainous volcanic island with peaks that go up 6,000 feet. Um, it's about 400 miles from, um, from uh, Portugal, which it belongs to. And of course, the wine produced on Madeira is called Madeira. And just know where it's located. It's um, stuck out in the middle of the, the Atlantic Ocean. And um, in 1418, uh, a, a Portuguese explorer named Gustavo Zarco uh, discovered um, uh, the island, claimed it for the motherland, and started to produce um, crops to bring uh, money to uh, the Portuguese crown. But they started with sugarcane. In fact, one source has said that um, it started the sugarcane, the um, plantation system that spread, of course, the Atlantic world um, using enslaved laborers. Um, uh, with growing sugarcane. But as you saw, a vo volcanic island is not in ideal conditions for, um, for uh, producing sugarcane. So at 15th century, um, they started producing wine and um, the other colony that Portugal owned, um, Brazil is where sugarcane was produced, um, bringing riches to the crown. But what happened was ships sailed um, from England south to pick up the trade winds 
And they picked up um, wine on the island of Madeira. And of course, they picked up enslaved people on the coast of Africa and brought them across on the dreaded Middle Passage. So uh, Madeira is part of, of the larger story of um, enslavement um, in the Atlantic world. And of course, I know you can't read this, um, this, uh, this uh, timeline, but just know uh, from 1470 um, to now um, is the history of producing uh, wine on the island of Madeira. And, um, and so just know that the, the Madeira wines um, are categorized by the types of grapes that produce them. So the lightest of them is called Cercial, there's Vidalio, Boal or Buell, and then Momsey is the most highly prized. And these are very sweet wines. In fact, it's my understanding, belief that people in the past like sweeter wines um, than, than um, many people prefer today. And if you see at the bottom of this graphic, um, rainwater, rainwater is associated with Savannah and hopefully at the end of our program, you'll understand why. Um, and also on the right hand side is at the top of the graph. So the types of ma uh, Madeira wines are categorized by the grapes that produce them. And it goes from, from, from kind of sweet to very, very sweet. And they're usually consumed, Malmsey and Boal are consumed um, after after a meal, sort of uh, after dinner uh, drink. And um, Madeira wine is sort of associated with men um, in the um, colonial period um, and the culture of consumption. This is Peter Manigo in uh, Charleston at a Madeira party. And you can see his enslaved worker there on the right hand side. These gentlemen are drinking punch and they're drinking Madeira out of decanters that they pass around and serve their wine themselves. So um, uh, it, this is a tradition that is 18th century, the golden age of Madeira um, uh, in, in the world. Uh, and just know that George Washington and our founding fathers loved Madeira. In fact, I've heard that, um, read that uh, George Washington drank a pint a day of this very sweet uh, fortified beverage. And, he, and his granddaughter said he liked to sit after dinner and drink three glasses of Madeira. He drank a lot of Madeira. And he's just an example of founding fathers drinking Madeira. Now, one of the things about Madeira that, I, that is important to know is that it is balled up with the romance of the sea. So when they put wine into the hulls of sailing ships in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century on the island of Madeira, it got sloshed around and heated and you think that would ruin it, it made it better. So Madeira wine is a pasteurized wine. It's heated to make it what it will become. Um, also, Madeira wine is associated with um, British maritime law. Um, in 1663 or so, um, Charles II was making laws for uh, the colonies. Only British goods and British ships could sell to the colonies, um, and they were taxed, except for wine and items produced on the island of Madeira, um, because there was um, a, uh, a royal relationship with, with Portuguese, and Charles II was married to Catherine Braganza of Portugal, so their stuff was a, a tax, as far as I'm aware. Um, so, and Savannah being a port city, a port of call to bring um, wine from, um, from the, uh, uh, the European world, uh, old world to the new world, um, port city. And, um, and just know that people drank a lot in, uh, in the 18th and 19th century. And you see this really big spike in the new nation um, supposedly every man and woman um, in, in America drank 7.1 gallons of absolute alcohol every year. Um, and there was a real concern about that in some areas. But, um, but I think the big concern was more about whiskey and gin than drinking wine. So we just know people drank a lot of wine in the past. Um, and in Savannah, if you look at the newspaper, you'll see all kinds of alcoholic beverages for sale in the 1820s, which is what we talk about the Davenport House. And so uh, gin and cider and rum, but you will see a lot of Madeira advertised. And so this is what an advertisement would look like, two advertisements. And so what would happen is this wine would come in huge containers called pipes. 
um, which is my understanding is about 126 gallons. So you've got pipes and half pipes and casks, which are all quite huge. And so going to where these pipes were stored in a mercantile situation and, and having some siphoned off in a demijohn or a jug and brought being brought back to the household is my understanding of how regular Savanians would get their Madeira from the store. And so advertised a lot in the paper, Madeira wines and old wines. So it didn't just come in bottles. Um, it came in what we say casks and carboys, demijohns, pipes, and butts. All of these um, denoted sizes of containers that were put into the holes of sailing ships. Um, you just know um, in Savannah, you know, geeky people um, at house museums look at estate inventories to see what people had in order to interpret these houses. And so these people on the screen now are people that Isaiah Davenport might have known or people would have known in Savannah. And so you will see Hugh McCall's estate inventory. He had 90 bottles, a very, a very large, a portion, large portion of his estate inventory was involved with old wine, which is Madeira. Also William Davies, eight dozen um, bo uh, bottles of Madeira. And you look down to Joseph Habersham. Um, and so he had 20 dozen bottles and I'm, and I'm not sure if Fitz Owen cargo wine might also be Madeira. So Savannah, Savannians, um, uh, Savannah gentlemen um, drank Madeira in, um, in the early 19th century. And just know that Madeira was the to toasting beverage of early Americans. So this is a, a, a genre painting from the early 19th century. And if you look on the um, on the right hand side, there is a decanter. It's the betrothal, and everybody, somebody's crying and somebody's happy, but they're getting ready to toast this um, marriage. Um, and so they would be have been drinking with this Madeira wine, a a tawny amber colored um, toasting beverage. It's not the champagne that we think of. Uh, toasting would have been done with Madeira wine. Um, and this is a poor slide of a very important picture. I think every house museum that talks about the early 19th century uses this. This is by an artist named Henry Sargent. It is of a dinner party. That's the name of the painting. And it was done, I think, around 1820. But this is what a Madeira party would look like. You can see the sun streaming in from the, from the um, windows, even with the shutters pulled. So this is an early 19th century after the dessert after the meal women would have gotten up and left the room if they were ever at the table to begin with and the men would have sat around for an hour or more with their um, decanters of Madeira there's Madeira here their jugs here um, and they would have uh, tasted four or five types of Madeira, commented on the wine, do whatever men do talk about. Um, they might have had cigars. So we've got uh, almonds and nuts and the, the canter would be sent around in a clockwise fashion um, for gentlemen to, to toast and to talk after the evening meal, a, a dessert. And so the evening meal was between two and four in the afternoon. Of course, there is an enslaved household uh, worker right there. So again, that was a description of a Madeira party. Again, after the evening meal, um, uh, ladies might have had a, a, a glass of wine, but they would have withdrawn into another room um, and the men would have been left at the table um, to, um, to uh, taste different types of wine um, and discuss um, the issues of the day. Um, so in the Davenport House's collection, we have um, a bottle um, of Madeira. If you can see faintly, it says 1790. Again, Madeira is the longest lived of wines because it's been semi-pasteurized. Um, it lasts a long time. So this particular bottle um, was produced in 1790 and it went down off the coast of Georgia in a hurricane and was brought back up to the surface in 1980 and was given to the Davenport House by a member of Savannah's um, Madeira Club for us to have. Um, so um, longest lived of wines, if you open it, it will last longer than your traditional table wines.
And of course it was always served with the correct equipment, decanters and decanter slides and glasses, a glittering display of glasses. Um, and so uh, we have some things that would have been used for the uh, drinking of Madeira in the Davenport house, a sideboard. And you can see this uh, looks like a knife box, but it's really a box of bottles, decanters that could have housed, um, that could have housed Madeira. And of course, this is a decanter with a decanter slide or coaster and the dining room table would have been set um, after all the tablecloths have been taken up with a shiny table um, and then with the glasses and fruits and nuts um, at the end of a meal. And if you'll see right here, this wicker uh, vessel right here, that's called the demijohn um, that uh, Madeira would have been um, transported from the store and then put into a decanter. Now, there is one fellow that is storied with regard to wine connoisseurs, and his name is William Neal Habersham. Uh, his family uh, owned the Habersham Mercantile Company that goes back to the colonial period. And I believe that this picture is of his home, which is no longer there on the corner of Harris and Barnard Street. Now, uh, ha Habersham Mercantile went under um, in um, after the Civil War. And so Mr. Habersham spent the rest of his life from 1865 until uh, 1899 caring for his wines. Uh, and, and when he died, uh, his wines were sold at auction. And this is a copy of the um, auction catalog. Um, I believe a copy or the original is at the Georgia Historical Society in their files. There is a file on the Madeira Club and Madeira there. Um, and so just know that this is a quote about him, William Neal Habersham. He was said to be able to blindly name a wine's year, grape variety, and even vineyard. In his home in Savannah, the eccentric merchant collected Madeira wines, treating them to the sun in a specifically built glass house, as well as uh, finding his wines, finding his wines out from room to room um, to, uh, to increase their brilliance and clarity. So there is a discussion among wine people about how a particular variety of Madeira got its name and it is associated with Savannah. It is a version called rainwater. And rainwater, if you can see this quote on the screen, a quote from um, uh, that it's associated with a Mr. Habersham. Habersham. Well, we know that's William Neal Habersham. Um, and, um, and so they go on and on to talk about when Mr. Habersham would have um, uh, been involved with this. And then another uh, historian has said, no, 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 it was too, it was named too early to be named after William Neal Habersham. It must have been named after another occurrence related to Savannah. Now, the story that I am aware of is that before they got docks at the port city of Funchal on Madeira, they used to put large containers of wine down on the beach to be picked up by a sailing ship. And sometimes um, there was this one particular container or pipe on the beach headed for Savannah, Georgia, and it rained and, um, and there were uh, people uh, were afraid that this big container of 126 gallons of Madeira had gotten compromised um, by the rain. Um, but when it got to Savannah and they opened it, they found that they liked it. So while I hesitate to call it watered down Madeira, that could be what it was. Um, and, um, and it's a little bit lighter, lighter and drier than Malmsey Madeira, which most people know about. So just know that Madeira is a fortified wine. You put sugarcane brandy in it to, um, to make it what it will become, but it ups the alcohol content to about uh, 18 to 19 proof. And it's made with wine from different years. It's a blended wine. Um, also know that because it is pasteurized, uh, you don't need to put it in an underground cellar. So places like Charleston and Savannah, you could store Madeira up in an attic or someplace that is warmer um, than, than um, you might think would keep wine. So, um, and it isn't just associated with Savannah that we think we have more um, of a calling to discuss it. All up and down the coastal America, um, people drank Madeira and had Madeira parties, gentlemen did, white men did.
So um, this is um, what um, Madeira looks like in a decanter up in the Davenport House's garret room. Um, it's, uh, it's a dark color and again with, um, with lovely uh, glasses. Uh, it's very similar to Port and Sherry, by the way. Um, and so in 1954, a group of Savannians, um, some well-connected men, um, decided to form a, a gentleman's club um, that, um, a, that harkened back to, to the past of Savannah. And so they named this club the Madeira Club. And they, uh, they, they, I believe it still meets. You have to be asked to be a member. And, um, and uh the gentlemen are, uh, are asked to a certain member's house, and I think they have to wear uh, tails uh, or some such attire, and um, and they drink Madeira uh, before, during, and after their their uh, meal. Um, but at the end of the of the experience, one of the club members is to give a paper, um, and all of their friends who've been drinking all evening get to critique their paper. Um, but um, just know that um, the, many of the papers that these people, um, quite interesting papers, are in the Georgia Historical Society for people to read. And of course, the image that was done by a Savannah artist named Ray Dilly um, is showing, um, this is supposed to be from English history, the Duke of Clarence being drowned in a butt, a butt is a hundred gallon container of Momsey. And they made a joke that this is, uh, you've probably felt a bit like this, the Duke of Clarence after your evening, um, the next morning with your peers. And, um, and because the Davenport House does a program on Madeira, um, we got written up in, in Garden and Gun, I think it was 2018, about our experience. So we feel sort of wonderful that we have become part of tra the tradition of, of talking about a, a wine that is not that often drank in America. It's kind of fun to taste something, a taste from the past. Uh, and we do this every February. So um, we got written up and we I thought think we think we're famous um, and um, beautiful glasses and uh, part of, of, of uh, early 19th century life that was difficult and 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 hard and 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 also about hospitality so um, so uh, are the sources that you could consult to know more about Madeira wine, it's been written about a lot. Um, I will particularly um, encourage you to, uh, to uh, see uh, David Hancock's book, Oceans of Wine. Um, it was, uh, it's a very wonderful book that gives you everything you wanna know about Madeira. So, um, so uh, the da people at Davenport House love to talk about Madeira wine and I'm real grateful that city of Savannah wanted to hear uh, our, a piece of our story on Madeira wine and the early 19th century. Thank you, Jamie. That was fascinating. Um, so talk a little bit about what your Madeira program is at the Davenport House. Uh, we know we are not wine connoisseurs, um, but uh, so our, ours is a history story. Um, and we talk about, uh, and it's a very, uh, sensual story because you're in this house at, at 5 30 in the afternoon and in February it's starting to get dark and that was the time of day when people then would arrive if they weren't coming to dinner to to go into a um a dining room and talk about and drink and visit with your friends so we thought well we, we're not just men we're going to invite everybody that can fit um and so we visit the house at 5 30. we see rooms in the house where hospitality took place and we wind our way um, to the bedroom level where one of the rooms is set up as a dining room because we aren't going to sit down at our dining room and um and and and, and sample teeny wee little sample of madeira um so we do that in a bedroom that seconds as a dining room so you're sitting there with strangers and you have a decanter that you pass around um but with candlelight um and it's it's quite it's quite beautiful and 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 you're tasting something you've never had before with strangers and um one of these wonderful communal things and then after that we wind our way up to um one of our attic rooms 
um, where we that we rarely go in. Um, we go into and so we open and we put can and we're watching the candles. We're not being um, a cavalier about that. Um, and so we taste another Madeira and we eat a piece of pound cake um, because um, it's you things you learn. Um, English people don't call pound cake pound cake. They call it Madeira cake and um, and people in England and the Commonwealth drink a lot of Madeira, probably more so than Americans at this point, um, even though Americans drank it a lot during the colonial period. Well, that, that but, leads me to my next, my next question is, obviously there's still people drinking Madeira and the Madeira club, but when, when did there, was there kind of a decline? Like when did we go to drinking champagne for New Year's? Okay, um, well, it's, terrible things happened in the 19th century. Um, they got a blight and a fungus um, two different times in the mid 19th century, which did in the grapevines. So along with the taste and people's taste changing, um, um, being able to cultivate wine on the island just took a nosedive. And so it's my understanding, um, my limited understanding of horticulture, they got grafts from trees from America and they had to restart um, the cultivation of wine back on the island. And now it's in the proliferation. Um, but I think, I, and because of that, um, um, th there wasn't Madeira to drink and then, you know, palates changed. But I do think, um, you know, the Gilded Age, uh, maybe that's like popping the cork and all of that, um, you know, late 19th century, I think is when champagne sort of took over that role. That's, that's my guess. Okay. So, and I have one additional question. So you showed us some examples from this state records, like Joseph Habersham had 20 dozen bottles that were valued at like 600. And then you, the William Now Habersham's uh, estate records. I'm wondering, um, to like kind of put that in today's context or perspective, do you kind of, do you have any idea of what, what maybe a bottle would have been in today's money? No, I, I haven't, I, but I do believe that it represented a large component, particularly of, of Hugh McCall, because he wasn't a man of great wealth. Um, I, I, it, I, no, I could not venture a guess, but I would think it would be uh, a lot. And, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was a period, again, a culture of consumption and status. Um, drinking wine was sort of a, was a status thing um, as well as um, people enjoying doing it. Um, so uh, I guess maybe that might get to answer my question some way that it sort of, if you could afford the Madeira to drink, you were in the upper class. Right, right. I, I, you know, that was sort of a time where everybody conformity you know, the white community, the conformity, you know, many ha houses sort of looked alike. And, um, and so um, drinking Madeira was just part of that um, way of life is that, well, we're going to drink Madeira when we go to this place and, and they're, you know, up there. That's my, that's my understanding of it. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing this with all of us. And uh, we look forward to your next presentation with us. Me too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and being interested in this. It really makes my day.